Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ben Baker from Juniper Networks, and welcome to part three of our three-part blockchain webinar series. If you recall, in part one, we explored what blockchain is, what problems it solves, and what Juniper's point of view is on this interesting new technology that's generating so much buzz out there. And then in part two, we briefly discussed a range of potential blockchain use cases. We went through blockchain's weaknesses, and, and then we discussed the role that Juniper plays as you might begin this path to experimenting with, with blockchain. Today, in part three, we're going to drill down on one of those use case areas, specifically network operators. How are they approaching blockchain? What types of trials are they running? And where is their thinking in terms of using this technology? Today, we're very fortunate to have with us Dean Bubbly from Disruptive Analysis, and Dean has decades of experience in working with network operators and, and overall keeping his finger on the, the pulse of new technology trends and, and how they might evolve and what the larger ramifications are going to be. Now, with regard to blockchain, I, I don't think there's anyone else out there who has a better view of the technology and specifically how network operators will use it. So, Dean, maybe you can give us a quick hello. Hi, Ben. Thank you, and uh, thanks for inviting me along, and uh, also for your, your kind words just now as well. Uh, looking forward to uh, uh, trying to shed a little bit of light on what this means for the, the telecom industry. Great. Thanks a lot for being here, and with that, I will hand it over to you. So, to kick off, uh, this is going to be an independent view um, from an industry analyst on the role of blockchain for telecom operators. Hello, this is Dean Bubbly of Disruptive Analysis, and I'm going to be talking now uh, about blockchain and the telecoms industry, specifically um, the operators and what they can use the technology for um, and the nature of trust uh, around the telecom sector. So first, a, a quick introduction on who I am. I'm an independent uh, telecoms and technology analyst and futurist. Um, I've been working for uh, my own company, Disruptive Analysis, and previously uh, investment banks and also uh, other uh, industry analyst firms uh, since around 1991. And I focus on three aspects of technology. Firstly, on uh, network technology, especially in the wireless domain, um, whether that's 5G, uh, virtualization, NFV, and so forth, and some of the regulatory uh, policy and business model um, aspects of uh, cellular, but also fixed operators, as well as other uh, areas such as uh, the Wi-Fi. The second area is, is a little less relevant um, to this, but we'll touch on it uh, on a couple of uh, points. I look at communications applications and services, so voice, video, unified communications, messaging, uh, and so on, uh, including sort of platform as a service plays. And that's both for service providers uh, and enterprises and also consumers. And lastly, and this, this is where um, the, this session really kicks in, is I, I look at what I refer to as telco futurism. Um, how do uh, various other technology and uh, societal uh, and business innovations impact the telecoms industry? So things like Bitcoin and blockchain, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. I look at some stuff around IoT wearables, uh, even areas like uh, drones and robotics, um, which actually are having a a notable impact on telecoms, and it's the combination of two or three of these uh, areas that uh, give rise to a lot of opportunities. Perhaps the most important background factor before I get into blockchain uh, specifically is that the role of telecoms operators uh, is changing massively at the moment. Historically, the telecoms industry used to have a fairly linear value chain uh, with uh, network equipment vendors, device vendors uh, on one end, uh, and then service providers buying, uh, whether that was networks or phones, um, owning those assets, uh, licenses from government, um, turning them into uh, functional networks, delivering uh, voice messaging and sometimes data services as well, and performing the uh, marketing and, and billing functions uh, as a core part of their IT. Uh, and often they, they didn't really uh, extend towards the what are called value-added services uh, in some areas. That is now changing, and there's two different dimensions here. Um, firstly, we're seeing some of these uh, 
core elements on actually being eroded by competition and substitution. Um, so we have alternative sources of uh, voice and messaging communications, uh, whether that's for consumer or business. Um, we're seeing uh, certain aspects of networks being outsourced, a lot of virtualization, um, third parties involved, sort of mobile uh, virtual operators or wholesale plays uh, in fixed communications. And so the scope for profitability on those basic traditional uh, service elements um, is starting to be eroded. But at the same time, there's also greater flexibility and agility that comes in, uh, particularly around uh, the use of uh, software platforms as part of the network, uh, but also um, data services um, and the ability to extend uh, uh, existing capabilities such as provision of security um, as a function of the service externally in its own right. Uh, and this obviously is massively impacted by um, the impact of the internet uh, and more recently mobility and now internet of things. And, and the, the roles of the service providers are um, still taking shape and in my view they will vary quite a lot depending on size, heritage, whether they're fixed or mobile, where they are in the world uh, and also their ambition and appetite for risk. So in my work uh, as a futurist uh, recently, um, I contributed a, cha a chapter to a book called The Future of Business. And uh, the area I was looking at at the time was the future of the phone call. But what really leapt out at me was the other chapters in this book, which were um, developments and trends that were going along in parallel to the traditional telecoms industry, whether that's the network or the communication side. And there were things like um, changes in medical and healthcare, in terms of robotics, stuff like 3D printing, um, changes in the urban environment and the urbanization of society, a lot around AI and machine learning, but also um, relevant to this, the evolution of blockchain, shared ledgers, and a different view of what uh, computational trust uh, means. And the thing that, that became apparent to me was that all of the other factors have a bearing on the telecoms industry. Um, these are essentially orthogonal um, and yet will still uh, intersect with what we think of uh, on the network side and communication services and uh, other capabilities delivered from the network. So one of the visual methods that I use a lot is of a grid um, and look at what happens at the intersection points. Um, and so for example, just uh, simplistically here, uh, I'm envisaging as the, the vertical bars uh, a number of these areas of innovation and sort of future trends and development, whether that's AR and VR. Here we're talking about blockchain, um, IoT, and, and so forth. Uh, and, and then sort of transposing across, across on them uh, either network evolution, uh, the green bar on the bottom, but also the application and communications layers at the top. And you know, I'll, I'll come back later on to this idea of a grid uh, that rather more uh, detailed, um, uh, almost as if uh, you double click uh, on one of the intersections and there's another sort of fractal layer of intersections underneath it between more specific and more granular uh, elements. So from the previous uh, sections of the blockchain webinar in this series, um, the, the issue of trust uh, has been discussed. and. One of the things that is interesting to consider is, is where trust exists today in the telecoms industry. And when you dry, um, delve into it, um, trust is implied, implicit, well, it's either implicit or sometimes explicit, in a whole range of touch points across the industry. We, we're essentially putting our trust in uh, the network or in the uh, databases or in the regulations. And they manifest not just in terms of financial transactions, um, but in terms of records, for example. You know, if uh, um, one network terminates a call on another, um, is that uh, captured truthfully uh, in terms of the number of minutes, the fact that um, that particular number was the one that was called? Um, you have something similar in number porting. You as a customer, if you change your uh, network, you're trusting that your old operator forwards the calls to that appropriate number um, and maintains that link. Um, you're trusting as well that the new operator has the relevant systems uh, in order to be able to preserve uh, 
your historic uh, identifier. Lawful intercept is one where um, either lawful intercept or record keeping, if uh, a law enforcement agency asks uh, a service provider to hand over records, for example, uh, on a particular um, uh, person of interest, um, then there has to be trust um, that uh, those records have not been tampered with um, and that there is a, a chain of custody there. Um, as we move towards virtualization, um, we're seeing uh, a trust perhaps depending on how those um, individual virtual machines are being uh, priced by their vendors who may be different from the framework provider. Um, so you may well find that they're usage-based billing and then there needs to be some way to um, track usage, um, whether it's in terms of number of processes or instances uh, or users or whatever the metric is. And there needs to be some reliable way to record that uh, so that uh, perhaps uh, novel pricing models might be applied. And you can say the same thing when it comes to protection of privacy, um, your credit checking and credit scoring to uh, to see perhaps from a third party whether you, you are entitled to a, um, a subsidized handset. Um, and also you are trusting, well, you trust that the network is not intercepting your calls uh, and that it is secure. Um, and the network in turn uh, is trusting that your uh, identity is uh, what uh, it assumes it to be, and so there's trust uh, in a mobile SIM card, for example. And then at a more abstract level, you have things like spectrum rights, um, where um, I'm trusting if I'm uh, buying a license from the government to use uh, a particular bit of uh, the airwaves, I'm trusting that there's some enforcement uh, capability if someone else tries to, uh, to use it uh, and interfere with my operations. So there's a lot of different touch points, and I could have added another dozen or more on there. These are just examples. So, Dean, you've uh, so just to, to kind of set where we are. So in the last couple of slides, you've you've placed blockchain in in the broader context of technology advancements and where they might intersect with business strategies, network operator business strategies. And now, you know, with this slide, we're starting to move into Okay, blockchain, um, what are some of the characteristics of blockchain? Um, what are some of the problems it solves? So it solves problems around trust. And then from there, let's look at that uh, and figure out, okay, what use cases might it apply to the network operator industry? Yeah, absolutely, and, and also how that trust is manifested. So what I wanted to do here is, is just to sort of broaden the perspective to, to understand that there's an awful lot of things which – trust is implied in, uh, in our, our, either the us as consumers or businesses, our relationships with telcos, or in telcos' relationships with their suppliers or, or policymakers, um, and vice versa. So uh, I'll, I'll carry on from there. So historically, when we've had trust relationships, um, we've usually required some sort of intermediary uh, or perhaps a, a register of some sort of a database provider um, to exist uh, as a centralizing function um, to act as that sort of trust provider. And that usually adds uh, cost and complexity to an overall solution, whether it's in the telecoms industry or elsewhere. So we may have had uh, um, documents being notarized uh, by someone who is uh, appropriately uh, legally recognized. Um, some products have... Uh, certificates and stamps of authority. I've given Binance as an example where um, quite often uh, in most countries around the world um, a register exists of who owns what property in terms of uh, land uh, and the same is true in terms of uh, radio spectrum. Uh, most countries have a, a centralized uh, database of who has what rights in what places under what conditions uh, to use. Um, you know, the airwaves, but also the same exists in terms of physical infrastructure, so service providers that are, um, uh, have fixed infrastructure um, or uh, access to certain buildings. Right. And all this is, this is good, but the problem is that, um, firstly, these intermediaries uh, add friction, uh, cost, and sometimes error, um, and uh, you know, the question is that under, you know, for example, where you have changing governments, um, whether there is continuity or ways of trust in those institutions. Um, they're also often not very flexible when it comes to uh, new models for ownership or trading of rights. Um, they're not programmable, if you like. Yeah, you know, I think it, 
we're in for some fascinating battles here, um, and you know I think you can draw some parallels to the internet uh, to 20 years ago. And you know you got to be careful with analogies; you can always push them too far. But you know we saw 20 years ago it was all about distant intermediation. You know this this new thing called e-commerce, and you know literally hundreds of companies sprung up and. Some of them were successful, Amazon. Uh, some of them were not. Um, you know, we probably forget most of those names. Um, so, you know, with, with blockchain, we have these uh, incumbent, uh, you know, let's call them trust intermediaries. You know, are are they going to be so powerful to resist these forces of change, or you know, will they be able to embrace and use this new technology? Um, you know, will they be able to transform themselves, or you know, will they uh, go out of business and be overrun? Well, alternatively, is it just that we will have new um, things that we want to register um, with the rise of the Internet of Things, for example, uh, or new forms of Internet payment or content service? It may well be that we have new services as well as existing functions within the industry um, where we want to be able to create them to be agile um, and also where there is a, a benefit uh, either in terms of security or in terms of um, time to market, um, to have a distributed uh, registry rather than inventing a new authority and, and central central database each time we have a new service. And that's particularly an issue for the telecoms industry competing with Internet players. Um, if they have to you know, deal with the fact that there's hundreds of operators around the world which perhaps need to have mutual recognition, which adds potentially years in terms of uh, startup time, um, whereas perhaps um, uh, blockchain-type technologies on distributed ledgers uh, allow uh, much faster and more collaborative uh, approaches. So, so why is this a big deal? And why is, what, what, is, what does blockchain bring to the table that is, is fundamentally new for the telecoms industry? Well, first off, uh, as I've just referred to, it's, um, it changes the nature of trust. It might make intermediaries and registers ob obsolete, but it might mean that we can create new marketplaces, um, greater agility, uh, and, and sort of exploit this idea of distribution so that we can deal with perhaps intermittent connectivity um, where we can mitigate certain new uh, risks, for example, around uh, the IoT in terms of uh, uh, reducing the risk of uh, malware or uh, bad actors um, you know, using uh, botnets, for example. Um, but that said, and I, I will have a, a note of caution here, there are some visions around the blockchain industry which I think are uh, pretty much science fiction. Um, people have taken a good idea of what essentially is a distributed ledger um, and change of trust and sort of basically try to propel it far to the right of the diagram in terms of changing the nature of what is a company or even a government, um, do we need to you know, have the potential rather with blockchain to completely change our society? And, and I think that there's some interesting uh, some visions and scenarios that are painted, um, but I've seen little evidence to suggest that the bulk of human civilization is going to suddenly uh, change miraculously because of a, a new, new form of distributed um, storage of information. I think that the most important uh, dimensions for me um, are around the what's called immutability and non-changeable uh, nature of blockchain records, at least uh, for most of the blockchain platforms that have been suggested. Um, and I think that that um, translates into, and I'll come back to this later on, uh, as the anti-tamper capabilities. I think one of the, the big challenges that we face, uh, both as a society, but also I think particularly in the telecoms industry, is that there is a risk as we get more artificial intelligence that we will have um, counterfeit or fake data or even fake voice. Um, and I think that the ability to prove the chain of custody of uh, some form of, of information uh, from its generation to its data consumption, whether that is a, a voice recording uh, of uh, someone taking out a loan or whether it's the firmware um, of a connected machine is going to be really important. Um, I think the idea of sharing distributing data ownership um, is, is, is you know, obviously very use case dependent, um, but the idea of um, perhaps uh, multiple organizations being able to read and write to a shared record 
um, that has a, a huge impact on anything which looks like a supply chain, um, where historically it may well have been uh, paperwork. And you have supply chains that exist with um, data transmission and communication as much as you do with physical goods. Um, so that relates to things like interconnection uh, or um, telecoms industry, um, uh, componentized uh, offerings where you have multiple providers of uh, an end consumer service for whether that's for data or content or voice and video. There's some interesting potential for, for identity management. Uh, I'll talk more about that later. And then there's this concept called smart contracts where um, you actually have um, a particular contract or contractual element that is software defined and software enforced and potentially software generating the trigger for payment. And so you can imagine that in a telecoms context as being things like service level agreements. Uh, SLAs are one of those things that the people in the industry have talked about for, for a long time. Um, you know, how, how much uptime do you have? What are the response to uh, problems? What the time, and how, how long it should it take for over the course of a year? How, 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 many, how many nines is a network? 99.999% of the time it should be up. The very few um, telecom operators have been able to actually create contracts based on SLAs and enforce them and then perhaps either uh, use them to trigger payments or to trigger refunds. I think there's a, a lot of potential around reducing back office costs. Now, that's perhaps more true in some other industries like finance where there's um, some pretty cumbersome paperwork that goes towards uh, settlement. There are certainly elements within uh, the telco world um, which also um, have some friction that can perhaps be uh, ameliorated, particularly where um, you have multi-party um, financial settlements um, that is contingent upon data rec being reconciled where there may be differences of, of you know, how many minutes, how much data uh, measured at different points of the network. Uh, we should also be borne in mind that there are some, some negatives here as well. Um, one of the challenges around blockchain technology is the, the, the security mechanisms requiring particularly what are called proof of work um, to actually um, you know, authenticate the fact that you are, you, you are who you say you are uh, and the data is what it is supposed to be and hasn't been changed. Um, it's necessarily computationally intense um, and that has some implications in terms of what can perform those um, uh, those transactions. And as we move towards uh, the Internet of Things or low-powered devices, um, you may not be able to do all of that encryption and all of that uh, additional computing work right on the endpoint of the device. And that's particularly true of sort of low power devices like sensors that might be battery powered and, and hope people hope to keep them in the field for, for years rather than have them charged every day. But there may also be some additional challenges around security or at least proof required. Uh, and I think that um, a lot of the people in the telecoms industry tend towards conservatism, particularly on the IT and compliance side of things. Um, and I think that uh, um, are a lot of uh, uh, operator executives will be wary of something that is utterly new if it's replacing an existing system, even if it is uh, faster or more efficient, um, because until we know what the risks are, what the threats are, um, it, the people will take it uh, quite cautiously and through a series of, of proofs and trials. So, so Dean, in, uh, in, in part two of this webinar series, um, I, I talked about some of the, the problems of, uh, of blockchain and, and some of these you, you've gone over, and you know you can call them risks if you want. Um, and you know I wanted to get your reaction. I mean, my, my sense is that uh, for some of these areas, such as let, let's take power consumption, um, these these problems can be mitigated or essentially designed away, away if you have if you set up a, a private permissioned blockchain type system. So in that case, you know maybe you don't have to do such a heavy consensus mechanism uh, or, you know, a, a proof-of-work type uh, algorithm. Um, but then my, my sense is for, for some of the areas, like security, eh, okay, may, maybe not so much. There's still plenty of, uh, plenty of risks there. Well, I, th I think that's certainly true. I mean, there's going to be some issues around key management. Um, I mean, I, I can't claim to be a, 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 you know, the, the world's greatest security expert. So, yeah, this is certainly one of those areas where I would say that there's going to be a lot of 
close scrutiny on multiple layers of, of security. One of the things which crops up again and again in blockchain uh, discussions is um, what happens if people get access to enough computational power that they can perform a, a 51% attack. If, if I have, um, I, essentially I, I can change the consensus because I have access to uh, more endpoints or more participants uh, or more compute, essentially computing power. Um, can I erase or change the historical data about who's done what and what's in the registry? And, and that may mean, for example, implications for sort of physicality um, that you might want to have a, a much more broadly distributed set of compute resources. And that has some interesting implications for the network of, like, well, of how you um, have multi-site, multi-cloud, um, uh, even permissioned blockchains. And so uh, I guess the technology has really arrived when you start getting Dilbert cartoons, but uh, um, certainly um, th there is a bit of hype uh, around blockchain, and, and that's not that unusual for most new technologies. Um, but I think in the telecoms industry as well, I mean, it's, it's certainly a term that gets uh, thrown around a lot at uh, a lot of events I attend, but often without an awful lot of detail as to uh, practical use cases, or even details of, uh, of trials and prototypes. So I think uh, we're still some way off of uh, this uh, being a, a major change uh, quite yet. So, so Dean, in, in terms of uh, current uh, blockchain uh, activity going on, where would you place, where would you rank telcos ver versus other verticals, other industries? To, to be honest, it's actually surprisingly far down the list. Um, yeah, there's, there's obviously a lot of interest, but if you compare it with, or particularly various branches of financial services, and there's, there's many, many touch points in, in FS, um, whether that's on the investment side or um, interbank settlements or the origins, origins in cryptocurrency as well. Uh, and there's certainly sort of particular uh, consortia aimed at the, the finance industry. But then you've got things like um, trade and import-export, where there's a lot of back office paperwork. And by paperwork, I mean actual paper, um, which uh, is, is friction that can be taken out. Uh, I'm seeing interest in some uh, governments for things like you know, identity or, or uh, health records, or tax records even perhaps. Um, and then things like healthcare um, seem to have some special interest groups. Uh, and again, healthcare is a very broad area, and there's probably you know, five, ten, a hundred subsectors within that. Uh, telecoms is starting to come up, but I, I haven't noticed beyond the, um, the stuff that the TM forum is doing. I haven't noticed sort of telco special interest groups um, um, yet um, within the, the various blockchain uh, organisations. It's worth, before we dig into the specific telco uh, uses, uh, it's worth doing a little bit of uh, a backup for a second uh, on some of the terminology. Um, one thing that commonly gets used or misused is the, the term the blockchain as opposed to a blockchain or dis a distributed ledger. Um, when it's got the definite article the, it refers to um, the public blockchain which under, under, underlies um, Bitcoin cryptocurrency. Um, there are other possible ways of creating blockchains. Uh, probably the most prominent at the moment is Ethereum, uh, which allows essentially a lot more sort of developer flexibility and the creation of uh, smart contracts. Um, there are various uh, consortiums and uh, open source projects, uh, R3 and Hyperledger uh, are examples of that. But actually in terms of implementation, um, that also means there's a distinction here between public blockchains um, where, again, all the transactions are recorded on a, an open ledger um, where anyone can be a minor or a participant, or ones where um, the distributed ledger is, is just restricted access, is restricted to that, um, to members of an organization um, or, or even uh, a single uh, single company um, on what is sometimes called an enterprise blockchain. Uh, and this word permission crops up quite a lot um, where you, there's, there's an enrollment process uh, as part of um, 
participating in a blockchain, so it's not open to everyone. You might see that, for example, in you know, industry value chains where you've got a supply chain between component manufacturer and a, um, a, a, a subsequent final product manufacturer that wants to use this to uh, handle uh, transactions. Um, it could be within a community of interest. Um, there's some discussion around IoT about whether you could have um, blockchains for creation and sale uh, of solar energy, for example. Um, and that could be public if it's something where you want to have everyone uh, can add themselves to the grid, or it could be within a particular um, location or commercial organization. So, so where are the, the telcos and the telco vendors um, in blockchain at the moment? Well, there's a certain amount that has been said publicly. There's been a few, few press releases. There are a couple of investments that were made actually now quite a long time ago. Um, and I just, you know, from what I get from, from private discussions with people, there's a, there's a certain amount that's going on beneath the surface. But you have to say it's sort of patchy and it tends to be mostly um, the sort of uh, usual suspects of the, the large operators, those which actually do a reasonable amount of uh, internal R&D projects. Um, the, the two that get, get talked about most are probably Orange and Verizon because they made investments respectively in Chain.com and uh, Filament. Um, I think probably that was now in late 2015. Um, and, and that's certainly interesting, although conspicuously neither of those uh, sort of investments have, have, have sort of been turned into sort of large money spinners as yet. And, uh, you know, certainly Chain.com is interesting as a platform. Uh, Filament is focused on um, IoT um, and interestingly has some hardware as well as software components for uh, collecting data from you know, distributed or low power networks. Um, there's some other Verizon projects that I, I've heard about. I went to uh, an event a year or so ago with a, some a Verizon speaker talking about blockchain and, and the fact that they had a multiple ongoing projects. Uh, this is a, a public event. Um, probably the, the other thing which is notable in the last few months has been um, the TM Forum um, working group, um, which has a, uh, a focus on blockchain, and alongside that, one of their R&D catalyst projects. For those, for those not familiar with TM Forum, uh, it's an organization that's historically focused on the sort of uh, billing and OSS part of the, the telecom industry, and they put together these um, almost that sort of pre-commercial R&D projects called catalysts. Uh, which tend to have like consortium of you know four, five, six different service providers and vendors um, to uh, to try stuff out. And there was one that I saw in uh, their big conference in Nice in May, where they were using blockchain uh, to uh, generate identity uh, information um, for medical devices, low power IoT. Uh, and typically, interestingly, those are the sort of IoT devices that probably couldn't support a SIM card. Um, but which are nonetheless of interest to service providers that perhaps either want to have a general IoT uh, play uh, or perhaps a healthcare one. Um, and they had a, a number of, uh, of other parties involved in that, including you know, Microsoft, which was doing a, a sort of blockchain as a service uh, element of that. So that's, that's uh, interesting. And also internally, they have a working group which seems to be mostly focused around looking at um, whether blockchain and smart contracts can deliver service level agreements. Um, which is one of those things that people in the telco industry have talked about for ages, but SLAs are hard to manage in, in many cases, particularly where um, they're, they're dependent on quality of service or um, metrics which can't necessarily be measured and validated by everyone, uh, all the stakeholders involved. So blockchain potentially could provide a way of um, uh, enabling trust to be, if you like, self-managed and self-created. Um, BT, um, every, pretty much every blockchain event I go to, there's someone from BT there. Um, so they're clearly very interested in it, but there's not an awful lot they've announced uh, thus far. There was a, a pattern referencing an aspect of security. Um, so the yeah, AT&T, I noticed a, a pattern for a blockchain-based uh, HSS, which is a, uh, the mobile subscriber database, um, which is interesting. Uh, so again, there's, there's obviously stuff going on, on behind the scenes, but perhaps not by people who are you know, sort of media trained and externally fo um, facing. And I think this is a, a fairly typical situation in a lot of carriers, um, where it's people in the in the labs and the R and D teams, uh, the sort of futures 
Office of Future Technology, Office of the CTO, um, and typically those are not the organizations that get a lot of airtime in terms of speaking publicly. Um, yeah, and so there's, there's quite a lot which is going on under under NDA. A couple of other announcements um, uh, do in the Middle East, in uh, Arab Emirates, um, is looking at healthcare uh, IT and identity. And this ties in with the, uh, the government, I believe it's Abu Dhabi, um, that is looking at various government use cases for blockchain. Uh, and so here you can imagine uh, do wanting to be part of some uh, national or state um, uh, consortium looking at you know, healthcare, identity and security and record keeping, for example. It's, it's not directly related to traditional telecoms, but it's one of those instances where telcos have um, you know, broader IT and uh, uh, industry vertical activities. Um, Telstra in Australia has been uh, uh, discussing uh, the potential for uh, blockchain in uh, Security and data integrity applications, um, and that's uh, that's uh, that's interesting. It appears to have various other projects ongoing as well, uh, and I think again that that fits the the mould of you know, trying it out, doing proofs of concept, um, you know, viewing it as an interesting technology, but not actually having anything concrete yet on the roadmap. Um, there was a a company that I must admit I haven't had a chance to, to, to really dig into that, that put out a relatively cryptic press release with a company in California called TVCA Soft, um, uh, which appears to be one of the first telco specific blockchain uh, companies. Uh, I'll have to throw up my hands and uh, profess ignorance at the moment as to the exact details of what they're doing, uh, but they appear to uh, have a, a collaboration with uh, the uh, SoftBank, and particularly Sprint, uh, in the US. Um, there's a number of uh, service providers and related vendors uh, who are members of uh, Hyperledger, although at the moment there's no telecom-specific Hyperledger product or group, um, so Swisscom. NTT Data is, is, is a sort of peripheral arm of uh, Japanese operator NTT um, that does a whole range of IT um, services and products. Uh, and then there's a, a number of uh, technology and network vendors. Uh, I haven't put all of them on the slide, but there's some, uh, some, some big names that, that people would recognize. Uh, there as well. Um, in this sort of broader IT space, I think I, IBM and Microsoft uh, are two that, again, seem to be interested in blockchain across the board and who have at least some people looking at them from a telecoms and IoT, um, through a telecom and IoT lens as well. Uh, so I've certainly heard uh, IBM representatives talk about you know, crypto, cryptocurrencies as, as perhaps uh, a way of um, managing microtransactions for uh, mobile or mobile payments in the developing world. Um, I, that, it's not obvious to me that that's up and running yet, but it's an interesting one. Uh, and, and Microsoft seems to be positioning itself as a, a platform player with sort of blockchain as a service for, for various use cases. Um, it's not a traditional sort of um, it's like big telecom vendor, but uh, the uh, the cloud platform Azure is, is increasingly used in, in various aspects of um, telecoms back office. So that probably makes sense to sort of be focused on uh, platform rather than product uh, there. So D Dean, we have the uh, I'll call them the traditional cloud providers, uh, if, if that's a phrase. I'll I'll use it to refer to <laughs> IBM and Microsoft. <laughs> so. Um, uh, you know, a lot of activity from both of those companies. They're building out these blockchain platforms, as you say. They, they seem to have a lot of real customers. Um, what about some of the other newer hyperscale cloud guys like uh, Google, Facebook, Alibaba? Have, have you heard much activity from those guys? Um, I, I haven't seen a huge amount, to be honest. Um, either you know, generally for their traditional businesses around you know, search and advertising and social or something like anything which is particularly overlapping with telecoms. Yeah, you've got to believe, given their heritage and R&D budgets and general interest in anything that's, that's new, there's probably quite a lot going on beneath the surface there. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering whether you know, they're, they're essentially looking at using blockchain internally within products rather than as a platform play. Um, I'm sure Amazon ha you know, will be end up hosting quite a lot of the, um, the other companies' um, you know, blockchain backends on, on AWS. Um, but I, I'm, at the moment, I haven't seen anything that's specific from those guys in terms of a clearly productized sort of blockchain uh, 
Um, you know, I suspect it's going to be one of those situations where nothing is said until everything is said. Then, going beyond that, um, there's a couple of other companies that are worth mentioning. Um, I'll come across uh, a couple of sort of, if you like, general um, security or integration or um, you know, blockchain consulting companies that are starting to develop more of a telco focus that I'm seeing crop up at you know, telecom-specific events and that are talking to me about some projects in uh, in telecoms particularly, and you know, Guard Time is an uh, Estonian company that talks about um, uh, data integrity protection. Um, uh, Cytel is a general integrator in a whole whole range of areas, and you know, I certainly bumped into them at, uh, at um, you know, what I would have normally thought was, was pretty telco-only events. Um, there's a couple of interesting startups. Uh, there's one called Encryptotel, um, which uh, uh, you know, be thus far beyond... Uh, uh, a press release I haven't seen an awful lot about. And um, since I actually did this slide, I came across uh, um, uh, a company last week that's actually doing a, a coin offering around, uh, based on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, that is trying to set itself up. It's called Dent Wireless. Um, it's as a clearing house for trading unused mobile data allowances um, using some sort of blockchain-based mechanism. But I'm uh, I'm a little doubtful as to how easy they'll find that, but it's an interesting concept. Um, and certainly sort of, sort of suggests that the, the, the telecoms and network side of it, at the very least, is jumping on the ICO bandwagon, even if it's not necessarily uh, going to turn into anything real time any soon. In terms of other, other industry organizations, um, GSMA seems to be interested in blockchain, but hasn't said anything openly. I, I spoke to them a while back, and it sounded like it was very early days. And I haven't seen anything specific from uh, the, the technical standards uh, bodies like 3GPP yet. A slightly different angle to look at use cases for blockchain and telecoms is to think about the the timescales over which uh, data changes. D to be honest, blockchain at the moment um, has a, has a it's like a non-zero time for um, creating records um, and, and, ac and accessing obviously is, is easier. Um, but there's certainly latency in this, especially for um, the public. Uh, blockchain, the Bitcoin blockchain, where you know, there can be you know, minutes or seconds before uh, data is created um, and uh, the, um, the participants essentially converge on, on a consensus for the for the um, uh, the algorithm. Um, but, so, when you think about what data gets stored in telecoms ledgers and databases and registries today that could be blockchain suitable, my sense is that we will see things that change over longer time frames uh, being most relevant to blockchain. So if you think about things like number portability, yeah, that, that changes once a year or, or when, when or sometimes once every several years if someone churns. Um, you know, interconnect billing um, might be done at the end of a month or end of a week. Um, and I think that uh, you're going to see things like that, which is a periodic settlement process that, that is a little bit more of a natural fit. At the other end of the scale, things have changed in milliseconds. So you know, the internals of a mobile network or a second, the balance management for prepay users, you know, if you're roaming or something like that, you are consuming data by the second. Um, that is, is very much a, something which needs a, a near real-time uh, software platform. And I don't think at the moment uh, we can expect uh, blockchain uh, to be put in any of its guises to be providing um, that type of uh, capability. Another way of thinking about use cases, another dimension, if you like, um, for, well, again, telecom specifically, but it, you could generalize this to other industries as well, is, is who are the entities involved with um, either creating data on a blockchain uh, or accessing it? And in, in a way, this points to where there are likely to be efficiency gains, uh, where there is a, uh, it's like a deficit or a requirement for trust. Um, yeah, and, and so we're looking here for the sweet spots where there are people, where there are multiple organizations or groups that need to work with each other. Um, uh, and there is, um, there is a certain level of, of trust, but it's not perfect. Um, yeah, that, that, to my mind, is, is, a, is a sweet spot for, for adoption where you can perhaps 
um, a lot you know, coupled with the, the timing issues I just discussed, um, you look for those use cases where there is friction in existing back office systems, um, where there is um, a need for you know, automated or, or self-managed trust uh, as by part of the database or ledger. So, so here I'm thinking, you know, inside one unit of a, of a, of a telco, um, blockchain, in, by and large, is going to find it hard to compete with existing custom systems. You know, inherently, you know, organ employees or subsystems with one, one of those, com one company, uh, will be optimized already. It, there's, there's implicit trust. Uh, I don't see that as you know, uh, a, a sweet spot at the moment. Where there might be more of an opportunity is where um, service providers have multiple function functional units. You can imagine all like, the geographic uh, operating companies or where there is a, a requirement to have a platform um, function which is accessed by the consumer division and the enterprise division and the TV division. Um, and, and that might be for reconciliation. It might be around identity. Uh, it could be around data integrity. Um, I think the real sweet spot, though, is um, between what I'll refer to as peer telcos and counterparties. Now, this is essentially the sort of telco to telco or perhaps telco to wholesale to telco uh, chains um, that we uh, we see in you know, interconnect, in roaming, uh, various aspects of settlement, potentially in the future around you know, cascading payments um, uh, and, uh, and also um, perhaps around, again, identity management. In the future, maybe for um, NFV as well, um, where you have one uh, service provider that is hosting, um, you're not just roaming the consumer, but you're roaming some of their network functions with them um, might be a use case here. And I think that's a, a really interesting domain where you have peers of common technical understanding um, and they sort of trust, in, trust each other in terms of things like you know, sort of shared standards, um, but clearly they have their own uh, auditing requirements and so on. Uh, I think you'll find that uh, the supply chain from technology vendors, network equipment, and software providers to the, the network providers is a possibility, again, aligned with um, NFV, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a subsequent slide. Um, I think that there's a, a lot of interest um, for service providers to, to, to offer blockchain-based services to their end customers, whether they're as B2B or B2C. My sense is that this is, it's, a, it's, a, it's got some big numbers attached to it. You can imagine this is micropayments for content or um, yeah, managed security. However, um, it's also those areas where you, there's a lot of testing required where um, you end up intersecting with the legal and regulatory regime if it's around financial services or financial transactions, um, where customers will have their own requirements to do security testing, and you need all the support infrastructure, the billing, and so on. Um, I think you'll find a, a really another hotspot is um, where you have a telco acting as a identity or security provider for uh, another community. And this is you know, like the line that ties in with the, the blockchain as a service and a lot of the IoT uh, arguments here, where the, the telco is a sort of a, um, it's implicitly trusted, but it is um, running a decentralized um, private blockchain on behalf of, uh, it could be a government department, it could be a trading community of some sort, it could be a community of interest I mentioned before the, the solar panels, it could be you know, people with self-driving cars who want to share um, electricity charging points conceivably. Uh, it is, but, but again, where you have a, a community that doesn't have the technical capabilities um, and in particular doesn't have a heritage of understanding and dealing with uh, identity and security uh, and perhaps in the future as well, um, data sovereignty on a national basis. And the last one is an interesting one, which is talking about telcos and regulators or governments. One of the use cases uh, I came across recently was uh, anti-tamper management um, for lawful intercept requests. If, if you, you're an operator and you have to hand over the, the call records for someone because of an investigation, how do you prove that those are, are genuinely what came out of the network? And so there's uh, an interesting uh, discussion there about whether regulators could use this as a, an auditing mechanism. The same thing, they could be um, requirements to have um, network uh, configuration settings, particularly in the NFC context, uh, recorded um, for e-cases of future uh, investigation. You could imagine a, 
a couple of years' time, a competition um, inquiry demanding access to um, NFE and SDN settings to prove whether um, you know, a particular incident occurred or didn't occur if there was a complaint by a, you know, a wholesale and a retail service provider. So, um, this is a scary looking slide. Um, it's a, 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 a two dimensional grid of use cases that span the whole of the telecoms industry uh, from my point of view. Uh, and to, 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 to me, this is more of a conceptualization tool and a way of thinking about the sheer diversity of possible applications and use cases and starting to map um, what this means for telcos in terms of the uh, the, the hotspots and so I put a, a heat map over the top of it. So to explain what I've got here is on the um, the verticals are you know, the domains within service provider of where they have infrastructure, where they have operations, services, and so on. So there's the the network, um, the actual you know, whether that's um, the the core network or potentially radio side of things. Um, there's the uh, the roaming and wholesale, the sort of inter telco uh, part of the industry. Um, there's the you know, that, that, and that overlaps a bit with the, the billing and operations support systems, but those are more to do with ongoing um, dealing with uh, the functioning of both the business and uh, the network. Um, communication services, I mean, voice, video, messaging. Um, content services could be anything from IPTV to you know, streaming music to onboarding partners from uh, with third-party content of varying forms. Um, cloud and uh, everything as a service, you know, on the sort of IT services uh, side of, of telecom operations. Um, that's primarily enterprise, but some consumer elements of that as well. Um, clearly, a lot of uh, telcos have um, both dedicated IoT platform units, but they may also have vertical um, specific groups that target automotive or healthcare and so on. Uh, and lastly, there's the sort of um, the value chain bit where you have service providers and their relationships with their with their vendors. Uh, and also with their partners of, of varying sorts and perhaps developers in some place. Uh, uh, then on the on the, the horizontal slices of this grid, there's the, the sort of general buckets of capabilities that blockchain enabled applications might bring. Um, data integrity protection of you know, ensuring if you like the anti tamper function um, to make sure that whether that's content or um, software uh, images are consistent with what they're supposed to be. In micro payments and cryptocurrency are, are pretty self-explanatory. Um, disintermediation, where a service provider is looking to use blockchain to remove a uh, an intermediary. It could be a, a wholesaler or of some sort or a, a existing registry or data repository, data provider um, that essentially just acts as a hub but doesn't add value uh, but ends up uh, adding friction to uh, uh, business process uh, and so on. There's, and there's, there's, there's a variety of other horizontals we can imagine around. You know, identity management gets discussed a lot, um, and whether you can use uh, blockchain to come up with uh, secure, uh, perhaps low footprint identities. And, and smart contracts is definitely um, something that the industry is very interested in, um, both for what I was describing for for uh, SLAs, um, but also perhaps as a as a, a managed service in its own right. And you could imagine. Um, you know, coming back to the community uh, aspects of or opportunities for uh, blockchain applications, um, smart contracts being applied to a particular function. I mean, maybe um, this uh, this uh, uh, ideal of trading uh, data allowances or um, other uh, service elements between people could be uh, an example there. But I think that the, the B2B uh, opportunities are greater. So, so what I've been trying to do here, and, 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 and I should Stress up front, this, this is a work in progress, uh, this diagram. You know, the, the moment, as I said before, there were, there were relatively few um, public announcements around blockchain. Um, there are, as far as I know, no telecoms, blockchain, commercial services that have launched yet. So the, the, the concept of, of overlaying a heat map on this you know, is it, sort of based around noise and perception, and it's quite subjective at this stage, uh, stage of, of, the, uh, of the game. And it's only over the next you know, one, two, three years, this should be both extended and um, you know, with richer detail at each of the intersections. And in fact, I suspect that what's going to happen is that over time, each of these intersections can be uh, sort of double-clicked on to expand another matrix in a sort of uh, fractal fashion. 
So the, the red dots are where I'm seeing the most action at the moment. And, and I think that the telcos, the IoT domain in general is probably um, one of the, the sweetest of sweet spots for, for blockchain. And that's partly because um, those tend to be fairly greenfield uh, activities for service providers where they don't have the legacy infrastructure and processes. There's often less regulation at the moment and a requirement for um, compliance that spans the same format across multiple service providers. Uh, and also there's an interest in agility and, and also frankly the people uh, involved are, are more likely to be those who are um, you know, inclined to experiment. Uh, and you can say it's probably the same around the, the cloud and some of the content aspects as well. Um, I think that um, as, a, as a broad horizontal, the data integrity piece um, is very interesting. Um, and I think that uh, I'll come back to that in a bit. Uh, but I think that the, the, we're going to see increasing needs to validate data of all sorts. And I think that's going to be whether that's uh, in the network or an NFV a scenario where it's a requirement to uh, ensure that uh, all the versions of VNF are uh, the same um, across the population, for example, and that there's not been a, a glitch or malware uh, introduced. Um, I think that's going to be the same for potentially if, uh, other devices uh, across both infrastructure and end users as well. Um, I think that some of the registries that get used um, are potential opportunities for, for blockchain. And in theory, things like number portability databases ought to be high on this list. Um, but there's going to be quite a long wait to sort of replace legacy services unless there's really um, huge amounts of cost and friction involved. Uh, I think smart contracts are of a huge amount of interest as a horizontal here, uh, whether that's in IoT, uh, potentially in uh, NFV again, uh, and also as a, a way potentially of... Um, uh, advancing future enterprise communications tools. Um, but um, I also think that, that we should probably uh, be realistic about how hard it is to actually get that through to uh, a commercial uh, implementation, particularly where it touches on core services like uh, um, telephony and messaging service providers. Uh, I think asset management is interesting. Uh, and that interesting, that might be the telco's own assets. Uh, and I think that, that one of the things here to consider is that this is not just about customer-facing use cases, but what is usable internally. Uh, and one of the things you tend to find with, ev with every asset-rich organization, um, whether it's an oil company or, or a telco, is that they're keen to track the whereabouts of their products to uh, make sure that, that nothing gets uh, mislaid or, or stolen, um, and, uh, and also a way of, of, of asserting identity over, it could be something that's not even immediately electronically connected like a, a duct or something, uh, but which has um, sensors uh, applied to it in future. And I've heard a, a couple of interesting discussions recently about you know, telcos as users of IoT uh, as well as um, uh, suppliers of IoT capability. For me, one of the sweet spots on blockchain for telecoms is this area of data integrity, of essentially anti-tamper um, for all forms of data. And I think this is going to be really important as part of security, um, whether that's ensuring that, that software is what you think it is, whether uh, collected data um, has been changed in transit, um, you know, wh whether uh, databases are consistent across multiple versions, um, and also, uh, there's some aspects that relate to privacy, um, regulatory, uh, NFV, and so on. And I think that, that this is going to crop up in multiple different um, uh, manifestations. And so I already dis uh, discussed on earlier side this idea of uh, are call records genuine if law enforcement, say, ask you to hand them over. Um, IoT, particularly low-power IoT, which are or sporadically connected, IoT. You can imagine a, a vehicle that goes in and out of coverage, for example. Uh, and it's important to, that if there's a data being collected um, that is being validated, that it hasn't sort of changed in some way between the sensor and um, the whatever the network gateway is, and then the cloud. Uh, and I think that uh, you know, the example being, I don't particularly mind if someone works out what uh, uh, my heart rate is on my Fitbit, uh, but I do care um, if someone changes it from. 78 to 178 in a database somewhere uh, and uh, has implications for insurance or, or whatever. Um, 
I think there's some uh, some interesting uh, possibilities around uh, net neutrality, around monitoring of performance and quality. So, you, as a consumer, you might want to know whether your data has been changed by a network uh, middle box. As a regulator, you might want to um, uh, work out what the configurations and settings were uh, on the network at a particular time if there's an accusation of um, you know, unfair traffic management. Um, for an advertiser, you might want to be certain that the advert is displayed um, the same way um, that you generated it. And I think that there's another area here around voice, image, and video verification. I mean, we're entering an era, era of, of like fake everything. Um, and I think that uh, yeah, if you get a voicemail from someone um, or uh, you get a, an image sent to you, understanding whether that was actually created by that person has been changed anyway is pretty important. You can imagine a financial transaction and someone says, uh, um, you know, we, we got your voicemail about the about the loan. Uh, I'm glad you agreed to the uh, the interest rate of, of, of 17%. And you, so you say, well, I didn't say that. And they, they respond, well, here's the recording. It would be quite good to, to be able to uh, have some mechanism to uh, identify uh, fake media. Uh, uh, I, don't, I don't mean the uh, reference to, to new, the news that like, gets floated around a lot. But it's actually, uh, I'm not seeing get solutions for this. But I think that this is one of those areas where it's possible to get ahead of the curve and start thinking about distributed ledgers as an um, you know, anti-tamper or anti-counterfeit for everything. So to pick out a couple of, uh, of other use cases that I'm seeing suggested for blockchain and telecoms, um, there's some that are... Uh, are interesting and some that I'm, I'm, I'm less convinced by that, that, that tend to get talked about, but I'm not sure stack up under scrutiny. Um, I think roaming and interconnect management is one where, in theory, um, the, there ought to be a lot of opportunity here. It's uh, um, an area where there's a lot of need for reconciliation between multiple parties, um, where some of the um, existing systems are a bit cumbersome, and also perhaps where you could add some interesting value um, with uh, smart contracts. You can imagine you know, roaming wholesale prices that relate to the actual network performance and coverage that an inbound roamer receives. could be a really interesting one. I don't think anyone's doing that yet. Um, registers of numbers and, and spectrum. I, mean, I haven't really talked about the radio network here, but uh, as well as numbering databases, um, there's an increasing requirement to record uh, radio frequency spectrum allocations. And um, there's a couple of things I've worked on recently around spectrum sharing, um, uh, where you have multiple users, perhaps with uh, temporary rights to spectrum or in particular places. Um, there's some technology in the US, there's one called CBRS, um, Citizen uh, Broadband Radio Service, which is almost sort of not quite open source cellular network, but you, you we're, we're heading towards more of a, a Wi-Fi type model, but where there is a requirement to, to register usage um, to make sure that you don't interfere with um, some of the incumbent users, whether that's government or broadcasters and so on. So I think that, that looking at a blockchain-based spectrum registry uh, could potentially yield some interesting new um, both regulatory models and business models. Um, SLA management, I mentioned, micropayments are doing as well. Off-grid IoT uh, is an important one. I mean, we like to think about you know, IoT uh, applications having uh, you know, always on connectivity, but the truth is that if you've got a uh, an oil pipeline hundreds of miles long, you may well have sensors that are uh, either temporarily or not at all directly connected to 
um, a yeah, cell tower or other infrastructure, and they might have to use mesh or multi-hop technologies. You might have uh, devices that move. You could imagine a, a train um, where parts of the, the route through uh, desert are not covered with uh, real-time communications. Uh, and so then uh, there is a need to ensure that uh, uh, devices are managed when uh, or data is managed when, when it's not off, off when it's off net and uh, has to be stored locally before um, later collection. Uh, and related to that as well is the fact that for a lot of low power IoT, you don't want to have the radio permanently on uh, if you are trying to get the battery lives of you know one year, two year, three year, however long. Uh, and so you might want a way of securely uh, encrypting and, and storing data and then transferring it as a batch later on. Um, there's a bunch of opportunities around NFV um, for blockchain, in my view, particularly around the monetization of billing side of it, as well as the security of uh, um, the, the version management of the software. Uh, and so there might be a way of using um, ledgers to record usage um, for VNFs if you're a third-party VNF provider that doesn't want to just provide a straightforward licensing model. Um, and that's an interesting potential. Um, there are some that I'm less convinced by. I see a lot of discussion of blockchain linked to eSIM, uh, the either embedded or uh, remote provision SIMs that are starting to come to the market. I mean, I've done some research on eSIM, and I think that it's overhyped generally. Um, I think it's interesting, but I don't think it's a game changer. But I find it hard to see exactly how that intersects with blockchain at the moment. Um, identity management. Now, I'll put this on both sides here. Um, and I think that, that there are certain identities, like IoT identity, uh, that make a lot of sense. But when it comes to um, you know, individuals, I don't think we're going to be having um, you know, uh, a blockchain-provided um, identity delivered by telco for the most part because they have their own identity mechanisms, notably SIM cards, um, that come higher up that priority list. And also because it's an area where I think there's uh, like to be a, a lot of conservatism um, around some of the existing security folk uh, within service riders as to whether this is uh, um, as effective or whether it comes with new um, risks or attack surfaces. I've heard other things around, can we use uh, blockchain for Wi-Fi roaming? And, um, given what I know of, of Wi-Fi and, and sort of the, the touch points of how that works, a lot of cases Wi-Fi is, is independently run by venues. Um, you've got multiple stakeholders. You've got old Wi-Fi gear. Um, you've also got the overwhelming power of the device vendors in that as well. Um, uh, and so I think that it, it, it sounds like a plausible option, but given we've had about 10 different approaches to cellular Wi-Fi integration in the past, I, I'm yet to be convinced that it's the, uh, the transaction aspect of it that's the uh, bit that's lacking. And then yeah, real-time billing, anything involving microseconds or millions of transactions per second is, uh, is out of scope at the moment. So to wrap up, and, and this, this is a snapshot in time, and I'm doing this in, in July 2017, and the rate things change on blockchain, it may well be that if I came back in one or two months, I'd, I'd have different views on some of this. But from where we are today, um, I'm expecting that the, the telecoms industry to, to adopt blockchain or distributed ledgers pretty slowly. I, I don't see this as a, an overnight shift. Uh, I don't see the telecoms industry as leading the charge on blockchain in the same way that, say, finance or government or healthcare are. But I do see a lot of potential, and I think we're going to see an acceleration in both the number of, of proofs of concepts and prototypes, uh, the number of vendors involved, the number of service riders that make announcements on this, um, you know, and uh, you know, there's a possibility of some surprises as well. Um, I think that um, some of the earlier stuff we might see is possibly that those um, intermediary um, related activities within telcos where we do currently have um, you know, central authorities that are charge money for certain things and uh, um, there's a desire to uh, disintermediate them. Uh, and so perhaps things around roaming and, roaming and number porting, although you know, it takes quite a long time to unplumb uh, existing uh, incumbent providers for that. So it might be in some sort of adjacent area or in particular geographies. Um, I think we're going to see blockchain used for enhancement of existing services and business processes. And I think this is particularly within the IT and security side of telcos. And I think the, uh, the, the compliance arguments 
um, and the ability to demonstrate the chain of custody of data that it hasn't been uh, tampered with, particularly on things like law enforcement. Um, I think that has a has potential uh, if it adds if it's a, a use case of being able to prove to law enforcement that, that that data is what it says on the tin and hasn't been changed in any way. Um, then I think that uh, service providers will, will pay for that uh, peace of mind. Um, you know, there's clearly a lot of interest on the security and compliance side. I think that we'll see ongoing experiments over the next um, six to twelve months, so 2017, 2018, um, on data integrity as a service, particularly for IoT. And that's an outlook, out, out, an outward service revenue opportunity as well as a cost saving one internally. Um, I think that where telcos have vertical uh, competencies um, that are not really related to traditional networking, so it could be banking, it could be healthcare, it could be e government, um, I think that you'll see service providers that participate, especially if there's government sponsored uh, blockchain initiatives. Um, and I, I am hearing a lot of interest around the NFV and spectrum side of things, but neither of those worlds are, are moving quite as fast as they like to think. Uh, and I think they also have a ton of other um, issues to resolve in terms of um, the technology standards and the, the skill sets. And to actually, you know, the, 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 there's not that many people who, un who understand NFV well. Uh, the number of people who understand NFV and blockchain. Uh, is uh, is an overlap, very thin overlap on that Venn, Venn diagram. So I think there's going to be some requirement here for uh, training of multiple skill sets and cross-functional teams. Um, I think one of the things you, that you should take away from the the grid image and the other uh, dimensional analysis I did around the, the sort of what types of uh, timeline and uh, what types of uh, organisational structure uh, adopt blockchain best point to the fact that it's going to be hard for service providers to adopt a, a monolithic blockchain strategy. It's like having a, a strategy for using electricity or using web servers. It's going to, they're going to crop up in you know, hundreds of different places, potentially, across the organization. And whilst it's useful to have some sort of knowledge management function about um, best practice or uh, case studies, you know, I, I don't think the people who are looking at micropayments for music are going to have an awful lot in common with the people looking at spectrum sharing or you know, NFV uh, pricing or um, data integrity for, for law enforcement. So I think that uh, um, some of the service providers would do well to devolve responsibility for blockchain activities to the relevant sort of technology or business groups. Uh, and I suspect you'll see quite a lot of it initially start, as we see already in the, the labs and office and the CTO function. Um, I, I think that, that one of the things we need to, well, ideally would happen soon, would be more blockchain-related standards initiatives um, specifically for the telecom sector. Um, there doesn't appear to be a hyperledger for telecoms you know, working group or set of projects yet, although there's quite a lot of network equipment and um, telecom operator participants in that. Uh, so that perhaps will coalesce over time. Um, you know, maybe there's someone on this call who's uh, prepared to take the initiative and, uh, and do it themselves as a, as a catalyst for that. Uh, and I think we're going to see other bodies like TM Forum is doing stuff, GSMA, wouldn't surprise me to see a few of the other um, standards organizations or a sort of industry consortia that we have a plethora of in telcos um, jump on this as well. One last thing. It's worth noting that for almost all of the things I've talked about, there are alternative approaches which are not blockchain-based. There's a lot of database technologies, there's a lot of ways of doing security, um, there's a lot of ways of doing um, you know, private key uh, and so forth. Um, so don't be, do be aware that there's some people out there who, who sort of have a, a blockchain-shaped hammer and are going around looking for nails. Um, that there is always going to be multiple paths to get to any technology endpoint, uh, and I think this is one of those areas where we'll see uh, a full toolkit uh, being needed. So I hope you found this interesting. Um, uh, I've uh, been following blockchain in the telecoms industry for uh, a year or so now, uh, and uh, a lot of the application domains uh, for much longer than that. Um, if you are interested in finding out some more about this or getting updates or getting a more focused briefing, I, I do have you know, some, some analysis that goes beyond what I've, I've shown today. Um, my contact details are here, uh, and please follow me on uh, Twitter or LinkedIn as well.
Uh, thank you, and uh, thanks to uh, Juniper to, for inviting me along to this. Okay, thanks, Dean, a lot for the great presentation. A ton of really rich uh, information from you here. And, uh, you know, if I can just wrap up really quickly, what I'm hearing is that in terms of blockchain and network operators, uh, you know, in a few areas we're at the experimentation stage, and in many areas we're actually even, even before that in trying to solidify exactly what the use cases are. So trying to match up what network operator pain points are with, with the capabilities of, uh, of blockchain technology that, uh, that might help solve those uh, problems. And with that, I'll uh, close out this.